The Faith at Work movement is on a cusp, destined for great things. God uses people from all kinds of walks of life and all kinds of professions to advance His kingdom. Work is a crucible that God uses to refine us. Everybody's work matters to God. The only thing that really brings lasting change is the gospel of Jesus Christ applied to every area of life. Leadership is people who can take other people's pain and turn it into passion. Are you overwhelmed by Jesus Christ? Well, I wasn't always six foot 11. I grew up as a scrawny kid in a housing project in New York City and uh, we were in a really tiny apartment surrounded by all types of people with different races, religions, languages, sizes, and temperaments. And it was a, a challenging kind of environment for us. You know, as a matter of fact, I remember uh, I'd try to go to sleep and I would listen and hear people arguing with one another in different languages right through the wall of our apartment. Well, the door of our apartment was a big metal door and when it closed, we had a sense of security and, and comfort. My family was close and we, we felt comfortable. The door of the elevator wasn't like that. If the door of the elevator opened on the third floor, we'd worry that tough guys would come in and beat the living daylights out of us. This happened all too often, unless my big brother Walt was with us. They called me Little Walt. If you can believe that, they called me Little Walt. And I was easy pickings for them when Brother Walt was not around. <clears throat> so I grew up as a very timid guy. I didn't speak very well. I, I was very nervous about the, the future and very wary of people who were not like me. <clears throat> I grew up and uh, we moved actually when I was 12 to the suburbs and that was a lot better for me. I began to gain some confidence and uh, and strength, and I ended up going to law school and uh, doing various things, got married. Everything was looking great. I had a great career ahead of me. And it was then that the Lord grabbed my attention and showed me how weak and defenseless I still was without him. I needed him to point the doorways out in my life that I would walk through and to walk with me every step of the way, showing me what he was calling me to do in workplace ministry. A particular passage of the Bible really resonated with me in this regard. It's 2 Corinthians 5. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ is reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongs against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Well, I don't know about you. How do you feel about the concept of being entrusted with that message, the message of reconciliation? That's the topic that I'm here to talk to you about today, reconciliation in multinational corporations, how the Lord has called me and how he is calling many of you to reconcile the world to Christ through what we do. So as a lawyer, I have to start with this. We always have to define our terms. So what is reconciliation? Now, in the diversity community, you hear a lot of talk about uh, tolerance. We want to build tolerance in the workplace. I want to tell you, tolerance is a great thing. It is a starting point for us to begin to work together effectively. You've got to at least tolerate the people that you're working with. I mean, as long as I don't know enough about you to distrust you, I can live with you. This tolerance thing only goes so far. Ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, we are called to more than tolerance. We are called to reconciliation, and that has to do with relationship and trust and a deeper connection. That deeper connection is not possible without getting behind the veneer of the people that we're engaged with. It has to do with relationship. I'd like to ask you to recalibrate your thinking about workplace reconciliation and do that with me. In that regard, I want to cover three topics. So I have three themes for this short talk. The first one is that reconciliation flourishes when we embrace diversity. The second point is going to be this. Reconciliation flourishes when we engage sensitively. And the third is this, reconciliation flourishes when small guys walk authentically through the door. So let's, let's go first to diversity. 
it's no secret in a diverse corporation, it's, it's like my apartment complex. You've got people of all races, religions, languages, sizes, and temperaments. They're, they're all over the map, and they're working alongside you. You know, it's tempting to think, wouldn't it be great if I worked for a Christian company? And then everybody be family. It'd be like, you know, going back to my apartment, you close the door. Ah, we feel really good. But workplace is not like that, nor is our calling, ladies and gentlemen. The whole concept of uh, reconciliation presumes something's broken. It needs to be mended. And something is different, diverse. It needs to be reconciled and brought in. My friends, we are not called to be insular and to get in our holy huddle. We are called to step. The workplace is the world. It is not our home. We were called as sojourners and visitors temporarily in the world. This is what God's calling is for us. It's not home. You know, the concept of trust is absolutely essential in corporations. So let's get really practical here. I work for Texas Instruments. It's a company that makes these little teeny things. They are just microscopic and incredibly complex. In order to build just one of these things, you have to have somebody who will conceive of, well, what features would I put in this? What would I try? How would I design it? What would go into it? What kind of capability would I put in there? And then how in the world would I build this little thing? It's incredibly complex. Thousands of different circuits of and how would I explain to people how to use this thing? And uh, how would I fix it if something went wrong? All those questions. You know, it takes hundreds of people to build, to conceive of, and bring to production some widget that size. It's amazing. And those people have to engage with one another on a level higher than tolerance. They don't just tolerate one another. They've got to trust one another. So what does it mean to trust and build that kind of trust? Well, if somebody in, the, in that long list of people who's engaged in this were to you know, cut corners and not tell anybody about it, were to make a mistake and, gee, I don't want to admit that I made a mistake. Somebody was to do that, the whole house of cards can come tumbling down. It can be a major problem. We need to be able to trust one another, and trust is a big issue in the workplace. Well, now, I know that there's an elephant in the room right now about diversity, and I want to address that elephant. The elephant is, well, gosh, if I embrace diversity, I'm going to have to be so sensitive, I'll be walking on eggshells, and they tell me in diversity class that I can't say Merry Christmas, or I might offend somebody, right? Has anybody heard this? My friends, that's not diversity. That's uniformity. We are called to be ourselves at work. You know, the old is gone and the new has come. Your identity is in Christ. When you walk through the door of your uh, office, your uh, multinational corporation, the company is going to lose a tremendous amount if you don't bring your whole self to work. Don't check your faith at the door. Don't be afraid or cowed or worried about being yourself at work. You need to bring that, and the company actually needs you and wants you to do that. But there's a flip side to this coin that sometimes we don't focus on, and that is people of other faiths need to be themselves too. We need to create a place which is safe for them to come and talk. Many of them are eager to tell you what, what difference does it make when I'm a Muslim? What, at work, how does my Muslim faith, my Hindu, my Buddhist, how, does, how do these factors that are so important to me and my identity affect the workplace? We need, of all people, to be advocates of freedom of expression of religion in the workplace. You know, we're not going to get past tolerance and to reconciliation until we begin to deal with people at that deeper level. If we don't know what they believe, it's much more difficult to make that connection. Now, I'm not telling you to go out and buttonhole people and force them to tell you all about their religion, but many people are willing to, to talk about that, and it should not be a verboten topic in the workplace. The second point that I had is this. Reconciliation flourishes when we engage sensitively. You know, the history of mankind can be portrayed in various ways. For a lot of people, it's portrayed this way. It's a history of domination. The dominant culture comes in and forces the people against their will to do things their way. And there's a lot of resentment. And 
There's a lot of lying that goes on, and it's selfish, and it's greedy, and the powerful abuse the weak. That is very much a litany that we've heard again and again. Now, that happens on a national scale. That same distrust is aimed often at multinational corporations. I'll give you an example of Volkswagen. If you just Google Volkswagen News, what are you going to see today? You're going to see a bunch of stories about how a company, over a period of many years, perpetrated a fraud on the public said that they were testing and that these par uh, cars were meeting emission standards, diesel, diesel engines, and they weren't. How did they get away with that for so long? How did the managers not know about this? It is a very complex project, product, and in order to, to meet those regulations, other companies had to do all sorts of mechanical things, and they didn't have any of that. How did they get, what happened to the rank and file? How did they not question this over years of production? Well, those are the kinds of questions that are brought against multinational corporations, and they're brought against our corporations as well. Whenever one com company is maligned for unethical behavior, it reflects badly on all of us. Now, I'm not throwing VW under the bus. That kind of thing can happen. But, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are agents of reconciliation to impact the world for Christ and for the principles that we stand for. Uh, just like that tendency to, um, to be skeptical about companies. Oh, I know what big companies do. They get away with anything they can get away with. And they're going to take advantage. I don't believe. Boy, this is just the tip of the iceberg. I bet they're really bad in other areas, too. That same skepticism is aimed at Christians. You know, people, lots of them, believe the litany about Christianity that goes like this. Christians came into my country. They forced us to do things their way. They didn't care about us. They didn't listen to us. They didn't give a whit. What they wanted was to feather their own nest and make everybody else like them so they'd be comfortable and they'd feel good about themselves. And uh, Christianity has a bad rap. You can argue with that historical narrative and say those weren't Christians who did those bad things. That's not the point. The point is to engage sensitively with people. We need to realize that we are in a pit and we need to dig ourselves out. Ladies and gentlemen, it's essential to engage sensitively. The third point is that small reconciliation thrives. It flourishes when the small guy walks authentically through the door. Why do I talk about the small guy? Because bosses are great, but they're not enough. I'd love to have the boss just say, Edict, we're going to be an ethical company. Everything's going to be fine. I require it. But it's just not that easy. You know, we have different measurements different things that we track. And it's amazing. When you start tracking things, your performance in that metric goes way up. But there's a lot of white spaces. It can't all be measured. You can't just say, check all these boxes and everything is great. Fact of the matter is the bosses have some uh, downsides. They're unable to connect often with the hearts of people. The boss uh, can have all good intentions, but the people in rank and file might think, well, you know, I've saw the VW thing and I know how it really works. It's sort of a wink of the eye. Do it the cheapest way possible. If you can get away with it, do it that way. Some people think that. You can have an ethical boss. And what a blessing of ethical bosses. I've been blessed with ethical bosses, and it's just tremendous. But it's not enough to get through the, 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 uh, to the, uh, through the veneer, through the veneer and into the heart of people. A good friend of mine was a whistleblower. Multinational corporation, very large company. He was just a middle-level guy. He blew the whistle on unethical practices, and he was fired. I'm not here to tell you today everything is going to be peaches and cream. Uh, but it's really interesting. Soon after that, people began raising their hands in that company. And the culture of that company is now turning, and it's changing because of people like my friend. If all, my point is not that you should go around pointing fingers at everybody and finding fault at every little thing and holding their wrongs against them. That's not the point of all, at all, of course. The point is this, that if just a handful of people at Volkswagen had politely asked questions, how can we possibly be doing this? How can we be meeting these standards without the mechanics to make it happen? The whole story of VW would have been different, and the, and the cause of integrity would be bolstered, and it would affect us as well. So the ordinary person makes a huge difference. All this is from God, who through Christ was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongs against them. And 
entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. I want to close with a story of a gentle uh, administrative assistant, Marilyn, who worked in our area. She, uh, she became a believer and got real involved in her church after her mother passed away. She had spent hours with her mother, days and days her mother lived with her, and then her mother passed away, and it shook her. She started going to church less than a year after her mother passed away. Marilyn herself was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Terminal cancer. Well, <clears throat> over a period of time, she, it, was, it was only a couple of months that she had to live. Finally, she had to leave, leave uh, the office. She kept coming in because she said we were her only family in town. And then she finally got to the place where she had to, uh, to leave. And we had the, the typical situation, a, a going away thing. The boss got up and said, Boy, we really appreciate Marilyn. It was standing room only, by the way. Standing room only, and we had all races, religions, languages, cultures, and temperaments there, because that's the way our department is. It's a reflection of the whole world. And this small lady was there, and uh, so the boss says, thank you for all the great work you've done. You've been very efficient, and we've always enjoyed working with you. Very pleasant person, and we're gonna miss you, and we're so sorry to hear about your illness, uh, but we wish you the best possible thing. And it was a nice talk. And then Marilyn kind of rustled up a little bit. She was very frail she was in her seat. And the room got stone cold silent. And uh, Marilyn just said this real simply. She said, well, I'm just, I want you to know how thankful I am. She smiled and she said, I am thankful to people who showed kindness to me. And I am most of all thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ who rescued me and didn't count my wrongs against me. I am so thankful because I am totally confident that I'm walking out of this life and into the presence of God and I'm gonna see my mom and I'm just thankful. And that was it. I wanna tell you, we got people t talking in that room. People were talking to their friends in the aisles of the uh, you know, uh, corridors. They were, some of them I'm sure were calling home, maybe to their home countries and saying, this is really interesting. Am I gonna be able to face that last door? with the grace and confidence that Marilyn did. Ah, it was an amazing thing. I want to tell you that that day in that conference room, one small lady <laughs> at the bottom of the org chart helped reconcile the world to Christ. What about you? What about you? You stand at a door in your companies right now. I hope you'll walk through that door, not like the timid boy I was as a child, Worrying about whether it's going to open on the third floor. And, and, and not like a big person who's confident and, and brash and, and not even aware of the sensitivities of the people that you're talking to. No, not like that. But with grace and kindness. Like Marilyn did. Speaking truth to diversity. Friends, uh, the man upstairs, the man who does not hold your wrongs against you is looking to see whether you'll go through that door. I hope you do today. Thank you very much. <laughs>